Thanks for checking out this week's message. No matter where you are, we hope that you'll be inspired and know that you're part of our one family. If you enjoy the ministry of our church, you can help us share messages like this by supporting us financially. Just press the give button at onechurchsc.org. It's quick, easy, and secure. Now let's prepare our hearts for this week's message. I want you to turn. It's the same text as we were in last week. It'll be 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, uh, the second letter that Paul wrote to the young preacher Timothy. Uh, writing to all of us, this is just his audience, and then he was to preach and live these things out, is we are to hear the word of God and apply the word of God and live that out in our life. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Um, it will be on the screen if you don't have a Bible or your app, you don't want to open your app. Uh, I encourage you to bring a copy of God's word with you. I'm not criticizing. I use my iPad uh, to preach from, but I have a copy of God's word with me. I just encourage you to bring a copy of God's word. We will give you one. If you're a guest, we try to give you one on the way in the house if I catch up with you before you get here into the seat um, because I just it's so distracting to have your phone. My, mine goes off all the time. I just want you to take a few moments, at least once a week, that we unplug uh, from social media uh, and that we just, or any kind of notification, and we just focus on the Word of God. So that's why I encourage you to do that. 2 Timothy 4, 13. Paul is writing to Timothy. Uh, let, me, let me tell you again, the, the series title is Love Holy. Um, if you've been with me, I don't know, I guess for years now, that, you know, I was, I've been pastoring about uh, 20 years. Um, I think I'm in my 19th year of, of, of full-time ministry. And um, if you've been with me, somewhere, somewhere along the, the seventh or eight-year mark in my life, uh, completely uh, and radically transformed with the death of my mother, uh, she struggled uh, with her health. She struggled with her weight. Um, and so I began to take, and, and if you've been with me, you know January, I usually uh, uh, give and contribute January to stewardship and some, compassion, some, some capacity or, or whatever. Uh, and then I take February, and I try my best. Uh, I've done it all different ways, 28 days, 29 days in the leap year, but we want to see total transformation. Uh, I think that, that you and I, and I know I never heard this, this talk much at all in, in church. What little bit I went growing up, okay, and what years of experience I had on staff and, and getting preaching and being fed through, gosh, this is how, I'm, I'm 43, but when I first started up to seminary, uh, I was on a cassette ministry. I would get a cassette tape from First Baptist Woodstock, Georgia, uh, Dr. Johnny Hunt, and uh, others, I would get their cassette tapes. That's how long I've been listening to preaching. But I never heard anybody teach about how God loves us as a whole. And one of the, one of the greatest places of obesity or gluttony or, uh, I think, hypocrisy in, in that capacity is the platform. Uh, the preacher get up and and uh, rail on you using the word of God on don't do this and don't do that and don't do this and don't do that. Uh, and it looks like he's sweating chicken lard. Uh, and you think I'm being funny, but I'm being very serious, being facetious and a little, little you know, just trying to get you to listen to me. But it's, it's so hypocritical, all right? Well, you know that I've even taught on hypocrisy, and I will say first and foremost, I am a hypocrite, okay? There are things in my life that is not there yet. I'm like, Paul, I have not arrived yet. And so I believe that it is key that as he's writing this, this letter to Timothy, and really all of his letters, he co covers it in many places, that he talks about in this, this particular instance, Paul is writing to Timothy, and it, I think it covers how that God wants us to take care of ourselves wholly. Okay, so that's my heartbeat, uh, and I want to read the verse to you, 2 Timothy 4.13. Paul is writing, and he says, When you come, be sure to bring the coat I left at Carpus at, at Troas, also bring my books and especially my papers, all right? That's the New Living Translation. If you have a different translation, you may read in there where it says the, the coat or cloak, bring my books or my papers, and then it may use the word parchment, all right? Now, scholars believe that, and it's very simple to understand that the coat he's talking about. Now, remember, Paul's on the run, okay? So when he, when he left Tarsus, he left in a hurry, okay? And so he left some things behind. One of the things that he left was his, was his cloak, his coat, his overcoat to keep himself warm. One of the things that he left or some of the things that he left was his book. Some people, scholars, believe that when he talks about books, when we translate that Greek that's there, he's talking about these books. That he's talking about some of the books of the law. Some of them believe that it was books that really showed that he was a true Roman citizen because he was a Roman citizen. Now, he was a converted Christian, okay, that give up his ways, all right, but he still could show that he was a Roman citizen, all right, and what, what that would bring for him. The other that you see there, it says papers or books, 
in a modern translation, it uses the word papers, but it really is a, a reference to parchments. Now, it's dried animal skin, and we believe, and I believe this, but scholars believe that are much smarter than me, have much, much more education, much more experience that I study after. They believe that this is what he's talking about when he says, bring me the scrolls or the parchments. This is the, the, the bits of the Old Testament that he would have access to. This would be like the, the Pentateuch, the first five books. You know, he didn't have the New Testament, of course, because he writes two-thirds under the inspiration of God of the New Testament. But this would have been the law that he had. This would have been his his, his Bible, let's just say it that way, if you'll let me bring it into a modern uh, vernacular. This would have been his Bible. So he said, Timothy, when you come, don't forget my coat. Don't forget my books because I like to read. And don't forget my, my parchment or my scrolls or my Bible because I need to study, all right? And so I see in this one verse of Scripture that God is saying, just using Paul as an illustration to myself and as I'm preaching to you, to you, that God cares and loves us wholly, not only does he love us mentally? Our books. Our books. You should try to engage your mind. You should always be trying to engage your mind. The first message last week was how you and I are loved mentally. God loves us mentally. The Bible is so clear about Isaiah prophesied, I will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. It talks about in, in Romans, Paul would write the letter to the church at Rome, and he would say, listen, that you, that you are not to conform to this world, but be transformed How? By the renewing of your mind. It talks about capturing every thought. Paul writes the church at Corinth and he says to bring every thought captive and give it to Christ. All right? And so we talked about how God loves us mentally. And I told you, and I'm being very transparent through this series, that I, I struggle with mental issue. I struggle with mental disease. Uh, uh, bipolar runs in my family. Uh, manic depression. I, and, I, I'm not, I, and I could go on and on uh, that runs in my family and some of the genetics that I deal with. And thus, I still deal, deal and struggle with stress and anxiety, which results in depression. And I don't want you to judge me because I'm not going to judge you, all right? That's not my job, all right? My job is to get you to think, get you moved by the Holy Spirit. And my job ultimately is to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. But I want to remind you, God loves you, and he loves you mentally. He, he understands, he understands. And this was the one thought I wanted you to take away, and for some of you that didn't catch this, this first message, is that when he says, I want you to bring my books, it is a sign that he cares about us mentally, that we should keep our mind engaged, and we should always be learning. That's something that I, I, I picked up at 43 with a couple degrees. I understand that I'm, I'm always learning. I'm always learning. And you know what I find interesting? That a lot of times, now I don't, I'll give them credit from this platform, but a, a lot of times my daughters will teach me things just by the way that they, they, they are, you know, innocently serving the Lord and how their emotions are just still real innocent and not tainted by world and the fake and the, and the celebrity and the, it's just, and, and, it, and it just, and listen, I don't know about kids that you're around, but my girls will keep it real. You know what I'm saying? You got a booger in your nose, daddy, you need to get it out, all right? Or, or your breast stinks, or you, you get what I'm saying, you're picking up what I'm laying down. And so I, I, I want you to always be engaged, but the thing that I wanted you to take away from last week that I want to remind you that God loves you mentally is that, that you've got to come to a place, you're with me, say amen. You've got to come to a place where you realize and you're okay with this truth. You can't resist bad thoughts. Because you hear people teach that, stinking, thinking, stinking, living. Listen, hey, refuse, refuse, resist. All right, I know the Bible says, I know James wrote, resist the devil and he'll flee. He's not talking about in that mental capacity. You and I have got to get to a place that we're okay, that we have these bad thoughts. We're still flesh. We're still struggling with the, with, the, with the old nature. I know Christ has borne us again in our salvation through him, and behold, all things become new creations. But listen, I'm being honest and transparent with you. I haven't quite gotten all that figured out. I think that's why Paul wrote and said, this one thing I've not done, I've not apprehended yet, but I will forget the things behind me and continue to press forward to continue to grow mentally, physically, and spiritually because we're triune bodies created in the image of God who is a triune God, a Trinitarian God. You've got to come to a place where you understand you cannot resist those bad thoughts. They're there. They're there. Like someone would say to me, I, I used to be an alcoholic. I disagree with that statement completely. If you're an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic. You say, what do you mean? The thought is always there. And the realization that I have the propensity to make the mistake again keeps me in a place that I'm humble and stay close to God. So the same thing with my mental issues. Is, and some of you are going, we know you crazy. <laughs> Well, I am. Paul said, you can call me a fool for Christ's sake. Read your Bible. It's very interesting. You shouldn't just take what other people tell you. 
you got to get to a place where it's okay that you understand you can't resist those bad thoughts. But what you've got to get to a place to do is, yes, those bad thoughts come. Yes, those, those manic seasons come. Yes, those seasons of depression. Yes, anxiety is still there. Yes, I still worry. I understand. And I get your super spiritual self that you go, I'm not worrying. I'm just concerned, and I'm going to give you my prayer request. I get all the churchy stuff, man. I've been doing it a minute. I, I can smell the, the baloney a mile away. I didn't really want to say baloney there, but you get what I'm saying. You've got to be okay to be real and honest and open. The only way to get help is to acknowledge that I've got a problem. That's the first step in saying, okay, God. And you say, well, he already knows. Yes, he already knows, but he needs you to know that he already knows. That's why when he come calling for Adam and Eve in the garden, it wasn't that he misplaced them. He just wanted them to know, hey, I know what you've done, and I know where you are, and I'm still coming for you. I love you. So you've got to get to a place where you understand those bad thoughts are going to be there, but you, you can't resist them. You've got to learn to replace them. However it works for you and your walk with the Lord, you've got to learn, I can't resist these bad thoughts. My past is always creeping up. Satan loves to bring my past up. Especially if, if, I, get, if I get called to preach somewhere, like I've got an invitation to preach at First Baptist Westminster uh, in a few weeks. I'll remind you of that because I expect all of you to show up on a Sunday evening to support me so that I don't have to look at a bunch of people I don't know, all right? And I haven't been in a Baptist church in a minute, so uh, they're going to get a doozy of, uh, uh, anyway... Right? I, if I'm on my way somewhere to visit, or if I'm on my way to visit in the hospital, I'm always having these thoughts. On the way here on Sunday morning, you suck. You made a mistake. You said that. You thought this. You lost your temper there. All these bad. I can't resist those thoughts, and the harder I try, the more I get in a manic state, the more depressed I get. I got to get to a place where I say, okay, that's right. I, I do suck. I am bad. I have done wrong things. But in Christ, I'm forgiven. By grace, not by my faith, but by his grace, he saved me and set me free. And so I don't resist those thoughts. I just learn to replace those thoughts. And listen, it takes time. Some of you are going, well, it's easy for you to say. I promise you, I know the struggle is real. I, and I am not saying to you, hear me clearly. I am not saying to you and those that are tuning in, stop taking your medicine. I have said under preachers that would say that Jesus is all that you need. Well, who do you think give that doctor or that company, the smarts to discover that component or that molecule or putting those two things together to create that medicine that may help you focus and get through this manic state or this anxiety. I'm not suggesting to you. I do believe Jesus is the remedy. I believe he heals completely, and he can do that if he wants to, but he doesn't say check your common sense at the door. So don't, don't, don't hear me incorrectly, and don't hear me to, from in these next couple messages that I've arrived. I struggle as, as much, if not more. Sometimes I feel all by myself, and I can be surrounded by hundreds. I've got people in my life that will remind me constantly, get up, get on, let's go, don't worry about that, don't do it. It don't make any difference because it's just me and Jesus. I'm grateful for those people in my life. So, so don't, don't hear me over this the last week or, or bringing this up that I, I have arrived. I'm telling you, it takes time. So this morning, I want to move to this, this second area. Remember, we're triune people. We're, we're mind, body, and soul, I, our spirit. I believe that God created us in his image, and so we're mind, we're body, we're soul. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're triune beings, trinity. We're made in God's image. Three is a number for divinity. And then I'll see this one verse that captures. I'll use other verses to illustrate. But this one verse captures that you and I should be concerned over our mental well-being, over our physical well-being and over our spiritual well-being. This morning, for the next 30 to 45 minutes, I want to talk to you about physically being loved. That God loves us mentally and that, he, that you are loved physically. Now, I want to talk to you just, just, just a moment from, from, from my heart. I, uh, <laughs> if you take notes, I want you to get this. Now, they don't have, I do not send all of my stuff to the creative pastor, Chad. I do not send it to the media team. Because I want you to be engaged and listen, and I would encourage you to take notes, okay? All right? So I want to give you this statement. Body care, body care, physical care, body care is an aspect of Christian discipleship and worship. So for some of you that would say, hey, he's not interested. This is just a tent. This is temporary and a tabernacle. I get that. Just like I told you my concept of recycling. I don't hug trees, but I don't necessarily just cut them down. You say, wait a minute, you help Heath. Yeah, but we don't just cut. We'll turn a job down if we don't believe that it's critical that the tree be removed. But I also, on the other hand, 
Don't go fanatic in it because the Bible teaches me that one day heaven and earth, listen, they'll pass away, but the word of God will last forever. One day this won't be here. But that doesn't mean that I'm not a good steward of it. So when you say my body, it's, it's just temporary. Yes, but it's temporary, but you have been given it to be a steward of. And so when you realize that that body is given to you. Now, remember, Paul would write, did you not know? Do you not remember? Hey, pay attention. Your body is the temple of the living God. And so when we realize that, we begin to understand that personal body care, that way we take care of ourselves, that we're loved physically, is an aspect of discipleship and worship. Why? Because he, he's leading us to take care of it, and we offer our body back and worship to him. You see, I, I believe a lot of you are like me. You know my story, but for just the sake of making it make sense here in introduction, when I give myself to Christ, and I told you, even, even, even after giving my life to Christ, I, I, I was completely out of shape. I was at somewhere in excess of 320 pounds. I wore 48 or so in my waist. I wore a 54 in my blazer because I would wear suits most of the time I was preaching back then. I couldn't go to a regular store. Like, I've never been a small guy, right? I can remember I had to go. Some of you may not even, you may not have issues like this, but I've had, I have had issues since I was a boy. I couldn't go to the regular section. I had to go to the husky section. Y'all all right? And so I've always had social issues. I've always had self-esteem issues. I am naturally, by just my natural being, an introvert. I always think you're judging me. I always think that I don't fit in and don't measure up. That's what I war with every day. I watched my mom suffer and struggle with her health, and it radically changed my life as I linked that to the Word of God and as a leader, how I'm supposed to do. And so at this stage in my life, I'm out of shape, I'm overweight, and yet I am preaching as hard as I can to live for Christ and all these other aspects. And here I've got this big issue in my life and I've got this beam sticking out of my eye, and I'm telling you to get the speck out of your eye, and, and all these things. And I believe a lot of you are like me, that, that you have great dreams, that you have great dreams, that Christ, when he saves you, he gives you these incredible visions, these incredible dreams, but you just don't have the energy to see those dreams go through with. And we struggle. And then, like I said, when my mother passed away, I radically began to shift because I began to look over her life and how she would, she would worry about where she could go, if there would be somewhere, be somewhere for her to sit, if people were laughing at her, if people were making fun of her. All, all, these, it's all these things just clicked. And I began to really understand that God loves me wholly, that he's just not interested in me being spiritually fit and mentally capable, but he needs me to be physically ready to do whatever he asks me to do. If he asked me to serve in the children's ministry, and I was a children's pastor for a while. I don't have any intentions to go back there. I will let Rhonda, Jennifer, and the team handle all the children. I will, I will go in there periodically. I hope to get in there once a quarter and teach this coming year. But I realized I couldn't even keep up with them. Are you, I hope you're picking up what I'm letting Some of you are saying, this, what, what did I come to church for? I promise you I'm going somewhere with this. That a lot of you are like me, that you have these dreams, you have these visions, and you, don't, you just do not have the energy to get those dreams accomplished or get there. And you're struggling. And I want you to get this. I want you to get this, and I'm going to move on to, the, to the, the, the three major thoughts I have this morning that I want to leave you with. I want you to get this down right here. It is all about exercise. It is all about exercise. Now, you will see I'm not talking about jumping jacks or burpees or mountain climbers or, or, or whatever. I'm not uh, Zumba, uh, boot camp. Uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about that kind of exercise, so stay with me. It has a little bit to do with it, but stay with me. Being loved physically and understanding who you are in Christ, mentally and physically and spiritually, I promise you, you will understand that it is all about exercise. The first thing is this, you must exercise caution. You must exercise caution. You must exercise caution. If you take notes, I, I, I want you to really, really, really pay attention over the next 30 or so minutes, please. Let's stop for just a moment, take a breath, and listen to me so that nobody's offended. I'm not here to offend you. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm not even talking about you. I'm talking about me and how the Spirit's moving through me. I also am not talking about being skinny. 
I, I don't care. It's, it, it's never been about being skinny. It's about being healthy and understanding who give you the body and what you're supposed to do with that body. And you probably will never hear anyone else teach on this. I can Google it and I can catch Rick Warren teaching on it and just a couple other leading pastors. Because not only did he, they have a son that committed suicide and so they began to teach on mental health, not only did he find himself 80 pounds overweight and begin to institute the Daniel Fast, which I would encourage you to do some research on and do that and get, in, and get involved and get healthy, but it's never been about being skinny. It's about being a good steward of what God has given you. I enjoy gravy on my fries from time drive-in, but guess where I don't go anymore? I don't go to time in no more, all right? It's not because I don't like those people. It's because I have issues, all right? I don't know when to stop. I used to say if I was going to go out of this world, I'd like to drown in a bucket of that gravy. Just saying. Stay with me. I'm not criticizing or preaching down to you. I'm trying to teach you something to better equip you for kingdom work. You have to exercise caution. Under exercising caution, I have two thoughts. The first one is this. You got to exercise caution so you have to, <laughs> on what you ingest into your body. On what you ingest into your body. Let me show you how the Bible, you think I'm just going to give you a health class, and, and this is, no, 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 let me give you the Bible so you understand it's not my word, just it's the word of the Lord. The Bible's clear. If you take notes, I want you to write down 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. You've got to be careful what you ingest, what you ingest. 1 Corinthians 10, 23, Paul says this, you say, this whole section is over food. Uh, what they drink and what they eat, this whole section, this little, this little, this little dialogue, this little, this, little, this little conversation is about food, Okay? All right, read your, read your Bibles, yeah, I promise you. But, he, but it's what he said. you say, I, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. If you have a King James Version, it probably says something like this, all things are permissible, but not everything is beneficial. You have to be careful what you ingest into your body. You have to be careful what you ingest in your body. You know, I could give you all, all kind of illustrations. I could give you all kind of research notes. I could, I could tell you, I got into studying this week about epigenetics. It's incredible, Google it, epigenetics, and how you, you and I are not into this place where we alter our genetics, but by the way we change our diet, we can change the way our genetics and our DNA responds just by the way we diet. Food is medicine. What we bring in can bring health to us or can bring disease to us. Did you know that in studying that I, I, I was reminded that sugar... It, listen, literally, I, I, wrote, I wrote this down, that sugar is eight times more addictive than cocaine, and I've had my bouts with drugs, cocaine being one of them. The sugar is eight times more addictive. Did you catch that more? More addictive than cocaine. That's why when we begin to say, I'm going to cut back on these, our brains, our minds, we go crazy. i got to have my sweet tea. And we try to, we, you know, I don't drink sweet tea. I, I have my own vices, but sweet tea's not one of them. I give that up a long time ago. I drink water, and I like Sprite Zero. Uh, you say, well, the, the chemicals in Sprite Zero is rotting your brain. Well, my brain's pretty rotten already, so I get it, right? But don't judge me. I like a Sprite Zero or 12 uh, or, or, yeah, okay? But most of the time, water. I try to drink a gallon of water a day. I try. I start my day. Most of you know I start my day. If you don't, I'm going to tell you I start my day at 3.45 a.m., that way I can get up, get the cobwebs out, and be in the gym by 4, 4.15 in the morning. I can be back home to take care of my, my parenting duties as a dad to growing kids and a husband to a, a, a working lady and make sure everybody gets out and gets what they're supposed to do. And then I can get on with my job or my day or whatever has to be done. All right? And so you have to be careful what you ingest. What Paul is saying is, listen, yeah, you can have everything. on you, you can have all the chicken fried gravy you want. But I can promise you after a while it's going to catch up with you. Your daughter's going to do your blood work and your cholesterol is going to be off the chart. Your blood pressure is going to be out, out of control. You're going to end up with diabetes. You understand what I'm trying? I'm trying to get you to understand. I want you to think, yes, I don't want to offend you. I don't want you to think that it's my opinion. I want you to see that God has laid out groundwork way before any scientist or doctor come up with the Atkins diet or the paleo diet or the, or, or the Daniel fast or any, anything like that. It's biblical that you have to be careful. Did you, do you not understand that when God created us in his image that we were never, ever supposed to be uh, meat eaters? Did you ever think about that? The only time he killed an animal was after the fall of man, and we live under the endemic curse. Now, I like my steak, baby. I like my protein. But I'm telling you, there's coming a time that you'll be back to the way you were originally created to be, and that was a vegetarian. I'm not going to be eating no tofu, okay? I'm sorry, Caps. I don't, that's okay. I will if you invite me over and cook dinner because some of the pictures I see look absolutely delicious. 
But to see it before it gets there, I don't know how I can do it. But see, we don't think about stuff like that. We just roll with it. We, we, and this is what Paul's saying. You, you're saying, I shouldn't eat this, I shouldn't eat that, and you do this, or do this. It reminds me of, of these two great preachers. Or, well, one, one is probably the most famous preacher of all, is C.H. Spurgeon, Charles Adam Spurgeon, uh, the prince of preachers. If you've not, just stay with me a moment. He, he's a preacher of old, but, but probably the most famous, one of the most influential preachers, all right? And so he had probably the greatest, he probably had one of the greatest evangelists or revivalists in D.L. Moody come to speak for him. Well, when D.L. Moody gets up to speak, he rails for 45 minutes or so. He just rails on smoking. I mean, he just, I mean, it just, you, you, it's a sin, you're going to, he just rails on smoking. Because everybody knew that Spurgeon liked his cigars. Well, as soon as Moody gets done and, and, and Spurgeon takes his pulpit back, you can do this, this history. All right, you can read the manuscript. When he gets back in the pulpit, he says, he says, okay, Moody, I will give my cigars up when you put the fork down. You see, everybody has their vices. Everybody has their season. You say, I can have this and I can do that. I can have this. I can drink this. I can smoke. And I can, all this. Listen, he says, everything is permissible, but not everything's beneficial. I will take you to a person that, I, I, that they cannot breathe on their own because they enjoyed a cigar. I'll take you to a person that is on dialysis because their kidneys and their liver and things of this nature don't work like they used to, especially their kidneys, because they enjoyed a, a, a glass of scotch every afternoon. You see, I'm not coming down as a legalist. I'm just preaching to you the word of God. I can take you to someone right now that they, 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 they live their lives in a wheelchair because of diabetes. They've lost their feet and lost most of their legs. I take you to someone right now that they can barely see because of diabetes. Most people don't realize that diabetes will cause you to go blind. And I just want you to think that, listen, God loves you as a whole. And yes, you may be like me and see this ugly person in the mirror. You may think that you're always going to be out of shape. And I may kick the bucket tonight. But it will not be because I have not been a good steward of what he's given me. Yes, do I enjoy a cheeseburger every now and again? Yes, I do. I very rarely eat red meat. So yes, I enjoy a steak every now and then. But I, I, I have had issues with my blood pressure, so I've cut a lot of things out. Yes, even at working out two hours a day every day except for Sundays. And what I think I do when I make tents is a pretty active job in throwing trees around. So I'm not talking about necessarily being a fanatic, I'm talking about being very cautious about what you ingest into your body. Let me, okay, let me get really practical with you for just a moment. Let's say this for a moment. You're still with me, right? Let's say that Jesus sends you a text. Or he friends you on Facebook like that TV show. And in that message, either inbox or text message, he says, I'm coming to dinner tonight. What would you fix Jesus to eat tonight? Oh, I know that some of you go, some of you go I'm going to show them how we do fried chicken down here. No, come on, let's be real. What, what are you going to do if Jesus, I mean, let's, let's be serious for a moment. I know we're, we're, we're using our sanctified imagination. Let's say Jesus comes to the house to eat. What are you going to fix him to eat? Are you going to serve him the crap of the world? Are you going to serve him this, this microwave zap stuff? Are you going to do your very best to take mama's recipe or, or Paul, I don't know, whoever's recipe and create this incredible homemade dish, this incredible, uh, healthy, incredible, just beautiful setting and give him, and instead of feeding him all the junk and on the fly, and you say, I don't have time, so I've got to do the pizza pockets. I mean, I get it, right? Hey, I get it. I, I sometimes, I'm sometimes by myself with two girls, and, and listen, I was this past week, on Tuesday night, she's back to Bible study and classes in Central, so it's my job to make sure the girls have dinner. You know what they ate for dinner? <sighs> I mean, it was, it was good. It was good. They, they, what were them things? Them pizza bites? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I get it. I get it. They had, they had pizza pockets and pasta. At least the pasta was spinach pasta. I did try. I get it. But what would you fix Jesus? What would you feed him? Well, you say, I would do this, I would do this. Well, let me, let me ask you something. Where does Jesus live now? 
Oh, don't be so super spiritual. He's in heaven. No, he lives inside you. The moment you say yes to Jesus Christ, he invades your life. He becomes a resident inside the temple. Paul said, did you not know that your body is the temple of God? And yes, all things are permissible, but not everything is beneficial. So are you going to continue to feed the Jesus that lives in you? Are you going to continue to feed him the garbage? you got to be cautious about what you ingest because your body is the temple of God. You have to be careful. And let me say, what are you talking about? I want you to write this down. It, it, it is absolutely, I think, one of the coolest little concepts. It, 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 it's what I call Frankenfood. Frankenfood. No, not Frankie's Fun Park, okay? Frankenfood. You say, well, what is Frankenfood? Y'all remember Frankenstein? I like horror movies, right? I told you my mom was, she, she would watch the cheesiest, goriest uh, VHS. She was a horror, she just, and I enjoy horror movies. And, and one, of the, one of the classics is Frankenstein. Well, the thing about Frankenstein is he wasn't real, that he was created. He was put together. And so when I look at food, I look at it and I have this thought, is that Franken food or is that godly food? And you say, what is Franken food? Anything that's man-made and man-produced as far as chemically engineered or, 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 or the meat is mechanically separated, that's Franken food. And you got to be careful putting those things inside your body. You say, do you enjoy? Yes, I do. I, the struggle is real, but I want you to think with me. I want you to think with me. You have to be cautious about what you ingest. You also, listen to me, let me move quickly. You have to be cautious about how you invest your time. You have to be cautious about what you ingest. Because what you put in will come out, I promise you. I promise you. What you put in, the productivity will follow. And yes, you can grab a Mountain Dew and a Snickers bar. I used to work 12-hour shifts. You can grab a Mountain Dew and a Snickers bar, and you're going to run for a few hours off the high in that sugar, right? But you're going to crash quickly afterwards and be fiending, fiending like dope, fiending for another Snickers bar and a Mountain Dew, all right? You got to be cautious about what you ingest, but you also have to be cautious about how you invest your time. Write this verse down, Ephesians 5, 15, and 16. Ephesians 5, 15, and 16. Paul says to the church at Ephesus, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. I underline this, Ephesians 5, 15. Make the most of every opportunity. Because some of you say, hey, I don't have the time. We have to eat McDonald's. We have to go through the fast. I get it. I, I get it. I, listen, I felt so guilty this morning, as I was going over my notes, listening to worship, listening to preaching, I, I felt so guilty because, listen, we had a situation happen Friday that we've never had to face before. Now, I want you to listen to me, Lana, and the rest of you. Addie's not here, so we'll just have to remind her later. We had a situation that, it, and, 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 and listen, Lana will be 14 tomorrow, 14 years old. Wow. I had a situation that has never happened to me in 13 years. Both my girls, whom had never, ever played a single game, tried out for the soccer team. Friday, they didn't make the soccer team. They got cut. So it's an emotional time. It's the first time they've ever been rejected or cut from a team. And so as I'm thinking about this and what I'm trying to teach you and what I'm trying to apply to my life, I'm actually teaching them wrong. So again, I'm a hypocrite. Because I even thought when they get older, I hope they call me up and say, Dad, because this is, this, is, this is my cure to everything. I was silent all the way to the house and mama, she had to go to the grocery store, and this is my cure for everything. Every time something bad happens, and we've had all kind of stuff happen in our lives, our journeys, if you don't know our journeys, man, they are crazy jacked up, and Jesus is good. But this is what I said to the girls. I was like, let's go get a milkshake. It makes all things better. <laughs> I'm going over the notes, going, wait a minute. I'm telling you to be careful what you ingest and how you invest your time, and I'm telling my girls, every time you have something tragic happen in your life or cause you to be stressed, go to food, and go to the, not just food, but go to sugary, creamy, delicious, by the way, mm, food. You see how easy it is? I've had a bad day, and listen, don't think, don't think more highly of Sandra than me, because she was going to get them a, a pint of ice cream and bring it back, you know? This is, this is the world we live in. We have to be very, very careful and, 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 and careful how we invest our time, make the most of every opportunity. You'd say, I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't ever have time. You have to figure out a way to make time. 
I have learned in, in 20 years of ministry, nearly 20 years of ministry, I still get concerned when people say, uh, I'm, I'm leaving the church or I'm doing this or I'm doing that. So, you know, because it hurts and you want people to, you want to make, why did I, did I do this? But I've learned in, in 20 years, and when I'm told by staffers that we need more volunteers, I, 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 I put it out to you, want you to, want you to serve. But I've learned, though, this, this, this the hard way, people do what they want to do. People do what they want to do. And all I want to do in, in the time I have as your pastor is to get you to think. That is the, the way you're doing it, is it biblical and is it healthy? Is it making you more Christ-like? Is it bringing fulfillment in your life? I didn't say happiness. Happiness is a moment. That milkshake made them happy. We still had to have a conversation that rejection builds character. And that we, we, we are defined by when we find ourselves in a place that we have fallen it defines us to how we get back up and respond. We can either sit, sulk, and sour and never try out for anything again. I was proud of them that they'd even try out something they had never, ever even done before. That they'd go before their peers and go before other people and, and, and be willing to make a fool of themselves. Because I watched a few times they tried to kick it and missed the ball. Whew. Sorry, sorry, Lana, sorry. See, these things are practical application. This is the type of preacher. I'll, yes, I'll get a deep conversation with you theologically. Pray for me. They asked this year when we come to Africa that I have some outline and we teach on some theology. I am the least likely person to teach on theology and get deep with you. I can, though. But I want you to live. I want you to enjoy the kingdom now. I want us to be a good example. This epigenetics that I was reading about that I was turned on to through Pastor Rick Warren and some of the staff he has out there is that not only do what we eat, now listen to me, this is where I was going with that story, not only do what we ingest and how we invest our time, you know, guess how, who and what it affects more than just ourselves? Our family. How you spend your time. I know, Dad, I know, Dad, that you think that you've got to work all that extra time because you want to provide for them. I get That's how we're wired. We're protectors and we're providers. But we forget, man, that God called us to be the priest of our home as well. God invested time. And the Jewish man led his family by sitting at the dinner table or supper table. Remember Jesus said, if you open the door, I'll come in and sup with you. And this is where we get our word for supper. It's where they literally ran their home. Ask about the day. What's going on? How's Bible study going? What's going on in your life? This is what happened to, in my life today. And we talk about it. And so it was a teachable moment because even after the milkshake, because uh, all I could hear from the back seat was, I couldn't get it. You know, it was fresh. Anyway, I just thought I'd give a little sound effect. And we still had to have that discussion to teach. And you say, well, you didn't have to invest that time. No, I have to invest that time. Because like I said, she'll be 14 tomorrow. They'll be, they'll be if, if God help me, if they finish eighth grade, God help me. They'll be going to ninth grade. Four years ago by just like that. I was telling aunt and uncle this morning with Lana, I was like, make sure you teach her how to drive on y'all's time. I've got a spare, I've got an old riding lawnmower. I'm going to take the, the deck broke, so I'm going to take the deck off. That's what I'm going to give them to drive. You know what I'm saying? And we, we, I've even seen one in town where we can build the top over it, man, keep them dry. So it'll be great for them. I want you to listen to me. God loves you mentally. It's okay that we are messed up sometimes here. It's just the way we're created. It's okay that we struggle with image, but we can do something about it if we will exercise a little caution. People, people, I, please don't be offended by this. I have people. I used to do personal training. Used to do group. All, all this stuff is all this stuff that we think is new is not new. It's been around for years. And I'm, I am per, a certified personal trainer, and we do all these good things. And people from time to time will ask me because, you know, I'm avid about my faith, my family, my fun, and my fitness. And people ask me questions all the time with their posts, or I'll read their posts like, How, what is the best way to do this, or what's the best way to lose this, and what's the best way? Listen, I, it gets, it, just put the fork down. Like instead of having two, have one. Instead of drinking sweet tea, drink unsweet tea, or just drink water. I, I can't handle unsweet tea, by the way. There's something ungodly about it. It's just not Southern. I'm just telling you, I'm Southern born and bred. I'm kingdom bound, though, but I'm just saying there's something wrong with unsweet tea. Do you get what I'm saying? I'm not trying to offend you. Put it down. One of the things that we do, you, you've heard me talk about the struggle being so real. Don't bring it in the house. If you bring in a box of donuts and you leave them out on the counter, you're probably going to get up next morning and there's not going to be any there, or I might leave you one or a half of one. I just have issues. I'm a binge eater. 
I'm an emotional eater. Just that way. Hey, I'm even known in my house as the pantry eater. I will go in the pantry and shut the door behind me and leave the wrapper on the shelf in the pantry and eat this chips or eat that cracker or whatever. So don't think I'm preaching down to you. I want you to get what the Bible is teaching us. Paul said, bring me my coat. I'm worried about my body. I'll take care of my body. It is the temple of God. It is where God lives. I want to feed him healthy and holy things. I want to make sure that I invest my time wisely. I want to make the most of every time. The, the next thing I want you to exercise is I want you to not only to exercise caution. And see, I told you we weren't talking about necessarily exercise. But I want you to exercise. Listen to me. This one's huge. This is the, this is the, cru- this is the big part of my message. you got to exercise self-care. You got to exercise. Mom, you have to take care of yourself. Dad, you have to take care of yourself. Notice I started with mom because mom usually is the one that's on the bottom of the list or on the back burner. We men, we, we, have our, we have many issues. Mom, you have to take care of yourself. You have to have a time. I know, I know that there's this thing called separation anxiety. I, I understand like, like Lana and Addie were, were not home last night. I enjoyed it for the first few minutes. I'm being real with you. I'll text them. I, I'd love that they have phones in times like this. I'll text them, I love you, and I miss you, and I miss your craziness, because it just gets weird and quiet. You know, Sandra and I, we are best friends, and so we, we keep it interesting, and we have fun, and we watch things and talk about stuff and pick on each other, and we, we tell the kids when they're gone, we run around the house naked, but uh, you know what I'm saying. So I just miss them. I'll just see if you're listening, and I, I, I miss them, right? And I understand that, especially when they're young, you're like, you, you want to spend all the time you can, but you have to have times that you let nanny or grandma or dad just take care of the kids, and you have a moment that you unplug. You have to have self-care. Now, that's just a, an overview of what I want to teach in these next few moments, but you've got to have self-care. Man, you've got to have self-care. Listen to this statement. If you take notes, it's good to write down. There's a lot of good, uh, good nuggets in the message today. Caring for yourself is caring for your mission. Caring for yourself is caring for your mission. You have to help yourself before you can help anyone else. Do you remember last year when I did a series like this? Uh, I, I used the airplane because we travel and we, you know, we, every year we go to, to, to Rwanda. Um, and, and I always get a kick out of how you know, they say if it drops down. I'm thinking, man, I don't know what I'm going to be doing if one of those air masks drop down. I'm probably freaking out. I'm not worried about it. But, but, you know, if you've been on a plane, you go, go through that, that a lot. Duncan, man, you probably have it memorized as much as you travel, bro. And, and they want you to put it on yourself first. But you're thinking as a parent, you're thinking as, as like me as a pastor, and, and they'll tell you, um, I was even willing to sit on the curb with two guys with, 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 with guns, and it was Corey's fault. He was the one that, that broke the law, but I was willing to stay there. I didn't want to throw you under the bus, but I just had to. And, and, but, but, so my instinct is to say, no, don't help myself, help others. See, that's how we're wired, especially moms. I want to help everybody else, but if you don't put that air mask on first, you can't help. You'll run out of air, and you can't help your kid, and you can't help your husband, and you can't help the people around you. And so you've got to practice self-care because self-care is caring for your mission, and God has saved you to serve. And one of the things that you've got to teach your family and teach your kids is that you've got to care for yourself. Jesus said it was part of the great commandments. He said to love him with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. See, the reason you abuse yourself, the reason you keep putting garbage in, the reason you're not cautious in what you ingest and how you invest your time is you, 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 you trash yourself. You put yourself on the bottom of the list. And you say, well, it goes against the Bible. He says, don't be arrogant. No, I'm not, I didn't say be arrogant. I said practice self-care. And when, when, I, when, I, when I get real specific with it, let me give you a few things. Stop just existing and start living. Stop just existing. You ever get to a place in your journey that you just feel like I'm going through the motion? I mean, they're just taking me for granted. All I do, all, I'm, I'm like the ATM machine to them. That's all I am. I, all I am is just to run, run, run errands for them. All I am is to put groceries, to put shoes on. You know, that's, I'm, I, I just wash dishes. I just, I just do the laundry. I just, they just take me for granted. You see, that's just existing. That's just going through the motion and there's no life there. Yes, those things have to be done, but you can, you can see them as an opportunity if you have self-care that this is part of my mission and I'm taking care of myself. I have, I have a mental break and I have physical break and I stop existing and I start living. And listen, God, God is all about the abundant life. Remember, he said, I've come to give you life. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. See, when we talk about self-care, we're talking about kingdom work, and we're talking about God and how he's come to give abundant life. Now, the world says this. Listen to me. The world says, I, I, not abundant life. I want you to have an artificial life. 
As long as it looks good on social media, as long as it looks good in your snaps, as long as your neighbors think everything's good, as long as you make the kids and they're at everything and they're in every sport and they're at everything and that you're at everything and you look good, but you know that behind the scenes you're mentally about to have a breakdown and physically you're running on fumes and you're stressed out and you're stretched to the max. And listen, that's what the world promotes. They want you to look artificial. Jesus said, I'm looking for authenticity and out of that authenticity, I want you to have an abundant life. And what people don't understand, see, we, we've been caught up in this thing called a rat race that we think the more, the more, the more, the bigger, the bigger, the bigger, the better, the better, the better. And who dies with the most wins. That's, that's, that's false. When we look at the kingdom, it's opposite of that. He says abundant life, but in abundant life, it may be less. Because nowhere does he ever recognize the big gift. It's always the small. As a matter of fact, even with Gideon's army, he says, you've got too many. Reduce. I tell you today, she will be remembered. She give all that she had to widow's mites. It's, it's, it's not about bigger, bigger, more, 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 and run yourself to a frazzle. You've got to practice self-care, and you've got to understand it. And part of the abundant life is that you take time to just unplug. And I don't know what it is for you. Listen, for me, and you think it's crazy, it does multiple things for me. For me, it's getting up at 3.45. Do I want to get up at 3.45? No, I do not want to. I didn't even want to get up at 6 this morning to be here. Someone told me this visiting our church and said that they loved the church and they got a party. They said, listen, I was fully intended to be there last week, but I rolled over and uh, said to the old lady, let's just stay home today. I, I said, well, that's okay. Don't be mad when you show up on a Sunday and expect to hear me preach. I do not call my wife old lady, by the way. But I said, I rolled over and said to my old lady, let's just stay home today. I said, don't be mad at me. I get it. I understand. And you know what? They didn't have, they didn't have a clue what to say back to me. You have to unplug. I get it. Oh, I've been that preacher that stood up here and go, if you don't come to church Wednesday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, you don't love Jesus. Come on. Then I, then I quit the ministry, went back to work in a shop, and understood what it felt like to work 60 hours a week to bring home $400 a week and feel like trash on Sunday morning from working a long shift on Saturday of overtime to barely be able to make it to the house of God. I get it. I get it. Abundant life, not an artificial life. Stop just existing, start living. Uh, uh, under this self-care, love yourself. You are valuable. Love yourself. You were made by God and for God. We should treat our bodies as instruments instead of ornaments. See, it's not about skinny. It's not about, look, I know Hollywood, I know, listen, listen I read a story this week in all this study that George Clooney, when, when he started making it, you know, he was voted one year as, as top Sexy and I don't know how that stuff works, but anyway, but George Clooney, he was on the Walk of Fame where they have their stars in their hand, priests and feet, and he, and, he, and he went up and he, and he saw, um, uh, gosh, the, the, the guy's name eludes me now, but a famous actor from, from um, Clark Gable, and he saw the, 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 uh, the, 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 the feet print, and he saw that uh, they were actually small. This guy looked like a giant, but he said he saw these, this, the print was small. So what he did when he got his star, this is what George Clooney did. You can Google it, you, you, all this stuff, it's stuff I read. And, and, and so what he did is, is he normally wears a size 11. Clooney wears a size 11. That's respect, I wear a size 11. That's a respectable size. I mean, I'm, I'm good with that, right? But on that day that he knew that he was going to be doing that on, on the Walk of Fame, he went and he got himself a size 14. Because he didn't want someone to look back in generations to come and go, wow, those feet look pretty small. You see, that's, how, that's what the world promotes, artificial. We, want, we, we, we think that we're just, we're just we're, we're ornaments. And listen, I promise you, God did not save you because you look good. And God didn't save you because he wants you to look good. God saved you because you're an instrument of salvation. You're an instrument of grace. You're a missionary that God saved and set free so that you and I, as the temple of God, can use our bodies to worship him. As a matter of fact, in Romans 12, it literally says that our body is to be a living sacrifice offered to God. It's an instrument that we say, God, here's my body. I offer it back to you. He loves you physically and he loves you mentally. Self-care means stop existing, start living, love yourself, you are valuable, be liberated. There is freedom in knowing Listen to me, please. Whether you lose 22 pounds or you've gained 22 pounds, God will love you no more, no less. Do you know that? It has nothing to do with the works. Be liberated. Come to understand that your body is a gift from God. Oh, it may not work like it once did. It may have its problems. You may see all the faults and none. But God said it's to die for. That I love you and I've saved you and I want to set you free. And there's, there is absolutely liberty where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I am free in that area. 
I am free in that area. And I know that it doesn't matter that God loves me and that he knows that I'm doing my very best to live as healthy as I possibly can. So you got to exercise caution. you got to exercise self-care. And thirdly, you got to, you must, you have to, you got to, you must exercise. Listen to me, it's a big word, consistency. Consistency. Any journey, any journey starts with one step. Any journey, anything, anything that we do, this side of eternity starts with one step. It starts with putting it in motion. Listen, when I get up at 3.45, I'm, 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 I, am, I am totally unmedicated, uncaffeinated, okay? All right? I have a little bit of coffee in me this morning, but I'm totally unmedicated. And so at 3.45 in the morning, I got up at 6 this morning, but 3.45 Monday through Friday, uh, Saturday sometimes I sleep until about 5, but my body has a way of just waking itself up a- a- around that time, but but I, I am literally the most miserable person. I'm so glad they're asleep, all right? I, I cannot get, I can't get motivated. I can't get, I'm like, I'm not going to do this. I, I will lay there. And I sometimes just lay there for five minutes. I'm like this, you know, bump this. I'm, st- I'm staying. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to the gym. But I promise you, I promise you, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. It's uncaffeinated. There's no chemicals. It's just unmedicated. But I get myself up. I get in the shower. I, I already have my stuff laid out. I have to do that. If I don't lay my stuff out, like my gym clothes, if it's not laid out, I won't, I won't even fool with it, right? So I've, I've learned some habits that help me. So it's laid out in the kitchen. I know it looks kind of messy, and I, I have OCD. But if I don't have those shoes and those, those, those particular clothes laying there, I, I probably won't make it. But, but I make my way. I somehow, zombified, make it to the gym. And once I get in the gym, and listen, at, at 4 o'clock in the morning, there might be two other people in there. So there is no competition. There is no, like, I'm going to feed off your energy. But I start to get motivated. I start with something. I stretch. I start on the bicycle. I start, and you know what I've come to learn? And now I understand it's scientific, right? When I, when I start to put in motion by just starting one step, that watch this, exercise equals energy. That you think you need all this caffeine, you think you need all this, this, this help to get motivated, but if you could get yourself trained, and it takes about 21 days for something to become a habit, but if you get yourself to understand that you practice self-care, you're cautious about how you invest your time and what you ingest, you get up and start this habit and, be, and begin to put one foot in front of the other, that listen, I promise you, I promise you, I, de- I double, dog, triple dare you to try this, that if you'll just put one foot, one foot, one step in motion, that exercise equals energy and you'll become alive. The endorphins, the things, the chemicals that your brain released, the, the, the oxygen, all those things, the way God created us to be, we begin to come alive. And you say, well, again, I, I really, I, I really, I really, really, really don't have time. I want you to understand you have to make time. Some of you may like to quote this. You may even want to, you, you have already thought about sending this to me later. So I want to go ahead and cut your legs out, money, you, okay? 1 Timothy 4.8. You may want to send it to me from the King James Version because it says exercise profiteth little. I like the profiteth little, but I got good news for you. I'm going to help you with your Bible translation this morning. I wanted to read it to you from the New Living Translation, 1 Timothy 4, 8. Physical training is good. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. See, you want to come at it from the negative connotation. You want to say, yeah, the Bible says that, listen, Hey, bodily exercise profiteth little. I don't have to really. No, 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 no. See, you're seeing it from the lazy point of view. The gravy on the fries and the extra helping of sugar. You're seeing it from that point of view. You're seeing it because you want yourself to be an ornament and not an instrument. You want to ingest what you want to, not realizing that you're going to reap the cost of that if you're not careful in the end. You, you're, you're reading it from the negative side, saying that exercise, hey, bodily exercise profit. No, no, no. What he's saying is that it's good that you exercise physically. King's English, yes. Yes, it translates. That is not what he's saying there in context. Now, it is not better than spiritual exercise, but it's still good for you. And so you have to realize it starts with one step. Here's the other thing under consistency. If anybody's been in any kind of rehab program, you have heard this before. Relapse is a part of Recovery. Do I still eat a pint of cookies and cream? Yes. She brought in these things called apple fritters. I don't know if y'all know what I'm talking about, but it looks like this mess of dough that's been cooked and it's got glaze and apples in it. Wow. Wow. I ate every one of them. No, I left you one, didn't I? I left you one. I left one. She brought in two boxes of them, by the way. 
I don't know if I failed to mention that. I eat every one of them. You know what the Bible says. The Bible says if you fall, get back up. Godly fall seven times and get back up. Listen, relapse is a part of it. You say, I'm going to quit smoking, I'm going to quit drinking, I'm going to quit chewing, I'm going to quit running around with girls that do. Listen, you may relapse. Relapse is a part of recovery. You're going to fall. You're going to mess up. And just like I told my daughters this week, it's being rejected or, or, or being cut or making a mistake. Listen, let that be your identity. Sure, that'll be ruined to your life. But listen, don't let that be your identity. Get up and try again. Do something else. Move forward. Learn from it. Face it. Don't be embarrassed. Addie was like, Dad, I cried in front of him. Well, I don't care. Don't you let anybody tell you, don't you let anybody tell you that you are not fit or you're not godly or you're not woman or you're not man because you cry. Listen, I cry. Sometimes I cry at those E60 stories. Y'all know what I'm talking about on ESPN, those sports stories? Every, every, every college game day, they tell them stories. I, I'm, I'm, hey, something wrong. I got something in my eye. There's nothing wrong with being passionate about something. The problem is most people are passionate about the wrong things. And he says, listen, I want you to exercise consistency. Realize the journey starts with one step. Relapse is a part of recovery. And last but not least, Remember, you're not alone. You're not alone. So I, mean, I don't have the willpower. I am grateful that it has never, ever been about, going to be about, or will be about your willpower. It is about asking Jesus for help. I am an ever-present help. Present help. You just have to have the humility to say, Jesus, I need help. I need help. And be consistent. If you mess up, get back up. You fall off the wagon, get back on the wagon. You're not alone. We all mess up. We all made mistakes. We all had the propensity to do the most ungodly of things. And listen, here's the here's the here's the end of it. I'm done with this. The key to it, the key with mental health is rest. The key to physical health is rest. And so I want to end with this, right? Same place I ended last week. Jesus is talking about this. In Matthew chapter 11, he talks about, he says, listen, he says, I want you to do this. He said, I want you to come to me, all who labor or heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you. Did you know, you got time for one more little story? Well, if you don't, I'm going to give it anyway. In my study this week, I read about uh, these, really it's about folks that, 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 uh, that are in the Esquan, they raise horses, they farm. I don't know the right verbiage to use there, but they're talking about, especially this, this particular farm was in the Midwest, and, and uh, they're, they're prone to have um, fires break out. And so he was telling about a story, and he was equating it to the human nature. And he said these horses, are, it's the craziest thing, that, that the barn will be on fire. The brush fire will have caught up, uh, and it will be, it'll be where it's, it's there, and the, and the horses are going crazy. Uh, they're panicked, and so they go in. But when he was telling the story, what stood out to me is he said, if you don't hold on to those horses tightly, when you bring them and lead them out of that burning building that's caused the, burn, the barn, that's causing them um, to be so scared and panicked, if you don't hold on tight to those horses, that if you, if you let go of those horses, they will run right back into the barn that's on fire. The very thing that was scaring them, they'll run back in. And they said, well, the reason they do that is because they equate that barn with safety. And so I began to think about it like this for me. I don't know what you equate with safety, even though it could be costing your life. Maybe, maybe for you, your barn is sugar. Maybe your barn is just food in general. Maybe your barn is shopping. Maybe your barn is porn. Maybe your barn is drugs. Maybe your barn, your barn is alcohol. And, and you know that they're bad. You know that you'll die in that. You know, but it's, the, it's where you find safety. And what Jesus is saying is, listen, I want to replace all of that, and I want you to find safety and rest in me. And I want to give you three types of rest he talks about. Would you stand to your feet, please? I promise you I'll do this in closing. Stand to your feet. Band, will you come? Play me down. There's three types of rest that you can find this morning, mentally, physically, and spiritually. This morning in particular, I'm talking to you physical health and how you are loved physically. This is the rest he's talking about. There's this one. There's the first one. There's creation rest. And we know in the, in the, in the, in the creation process, it says that when he was finished, what did God do? He rested. So there's creation rest. So, so if you're a worker and you're, uh, you're overworked and you're, you're, you're mad, you have got to understand that God says, I want you to rest. Did you know rest was so important to God that it made the Big Ten? 
You say, what's the big ten? The Ten Commandments? That's how important it is. We watch Jesus when he walked physically this side of eternity. He would often be found by his disciples on a mountainside, pulled away, resting, praying, and spending time with the Lord. The Father, I mean. And so there's creation rest. So you have to rest from your work. You have to take time to rest. Then, then there's, there's what I like to call covenant rest. This is where we see God making a covenant with his people in Israel. He was saying, listen, I want you to understand that I want you to observe the Sabbath. A Sabbath doesn't mean Sunday, it means rest. And he didn't create it. He, listen, man was created for that Sabbath, that you are to rest, that you are to find a time that you rest, that you enter a covenant and that you, you say, God, I want you to rest, because it's important to him that you find this kind of rest. The other thing is this, is not only is the creation, not only is the covenant, but listen, ultimately there's Calvary rest. When Jesus was on the cross, one of the seven I am, the, the seven great statements he makes from there, he says, he says this, he says, to tell us that, he says, it is finished. It was, a, it was a complete rest. There's rest from old law. There's rest from legalism. There's rest from all, all, everything. There's rest in Christ. And so I don't know what you're strung out. I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know how worked up you are. I don't know how overloaded you may be, but I want to remind you that in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus said, if you will come to me, I will put my yoke on you. That means you won't sit soak aside. You'll serve, but you'll do it with rest. So whatever you're struggling with, whatever you're fighting, whatever you're warring with, I promise you at the cross, you can find rest. And some of you, you need to rest. Rest. 